Good morning. Good morning, Huskies. Well, welcome. Uh, welcome to our first town hall meeting in my presidency, and as I understand it, the first town hall in a long time. Has anybody been to one of these before? Yeah, have we had them? I think it's a good idea. I want to do this to have uh, open communication, and uh, this year, do two things. A answer any questions you have and give you a feel for where we're going, and also get to get us set up uh, for opening days. Uh, students are back. And it's so important at this beginning time of year to get off on the right foot. So we want to talk about both of those. Uh, let me welcome uh, Trustee Bowie. Thank you for coming, Bob, today. Appreciate you being here. <laughs> Bob and the board have been very supportive this year and helped us think about the many challenges we have. And I uh, really appreciate their leadership. Uh, also, many of the uh, vice presidents and deans and others are here in the leadership team, so if we have questions uh, in the Q&A session that I don't have a good answer for, we'll punt to them and sh ask them to give us the truth. So get ready. You're on call. Uh, before we get going, I, I want to just uh, uh, say uh, kind of on a sad note here that uh, I got word today that uh, Kay Forrest had passed away the long time chair of sociology and uh, many of her friends wanted us to put that word out so you all knew and could send your condolences and so uh, could we just start with a moment of silence and, and memory of our longtime chair in, in sociology. Thank you. And thank you to her service to the institution and all of our students. Uh, today, we're, uh, we have this great group here. Thank you for coming. And we've got uh, many people online using Adobe Connect. And uh, they can answer, ask questions as we get into the Q&A session today. And uh, uh, Brad Hoey down here will be monitoring those and can share those questions with us. We'll also have a number of people in the room that uh, will collect your cards if you want to submit a question on a card. And we'll also have microphones uh, if you want to go to a microphone and ask a question. And I, I do ask that you use the microphone so the people on Adobe Connect can hear what your question is. Okay? Great. So uh, let's get started. Uh, thanks for joining us here at the town hall. Uh, I, I really appreciate it and think it's a, a great way for us to kick off the new year. Why now? Well, the students are showing up and welcome days are just around the corner. And we've really thought a lot about welcome days this year in an effort to provide uh, uh, a more inclusive environment to really affect our students' uh, uh, inclusion into the university. So uh, this public forum is going to do a couple things. Uh, it's going to allow question and answers and then give you a sense of direction where we're going. This isn't the only forum. We've been holding uh, the, these around the university and the colleges and we'll be out in the other administrative units as well. Uh, so far we've done uh, liberal arts and sciences, uh, education and business. We've got uh, law later this afternoon and we'll be going around so we have a little bit smaller groups and can in get into deeper conversations if we need to. It's really my objective to do these to be as transparent as we can about where we are and what we need to do to move forward. And we have a, a lot of opportunity in front of us and it's really important for us to understand what those are and what we as individual, individuals and collectively need to do. So uh, before we get into the welcome days, I want to review where we are as a university, uh, how we got there, and why our focus on these welcome days events is so important. You know, there's many, many things we need to be working on in the university, but right in front of us are the welcome days and welcoming our students back to the university. So I'm going to show you a couple slides. And uh, these are derivative from a leadership re retreat that we had last month where we shared a whole bunch more information, but I wanted to distill it down for us today. And in that leadership uh, retreat with about 120 of the, the top leaders in the institution, uh, we talked about where we are as an institution. Now, when I looked at the uh, environment, uh, the competitive environment, the fiscal environment, the strategic environment uh, a year ago as I was coming in, I really felt like we had some important challenges to face. And those were around enrollment and fiscal stability for the organization. And uh, my sense is and still is that student career success is an important keystone goal for us to drive toward. We really want our students to succeed while they're here, but get ready for their careers and their lives. 
That's not vocational education, that's life education. That's going up Bloom's taxonomy and really helping them understand how to diagnose and solve problems. So important work and students, it turns out, want to have jobs most of them when they get out and most of their parents want them to have jobs and get out of the basement. So um, as a parent who just kicked our two kids out of the basement, it's time, thank you. And I'm proud of my kids, but, and they got great educations and it's helped them enormously. Uh, I felt like we needed to build that student career success platform on top of three pillars, thriving communities, and that's what we're trying to do in part here today. Build community around the university so we have common understandings and directions and we build a climate where we can talk about stuff. And sometimes it's hard stuff as we make changes in the institution, but we need to have an environment where we can be honest about what the playing field is and what we need to do to help our students succeed and move the institution forward. As we do that, we're gonna solidify our financial base and our program viability. Right now, and I'll show you some statistics here in a second, uh, our enrollment has been going down and our state support's been going down. That's put us in a difficult financial situation and we need to build a financial base where we can hire the right number of faculty and staff and we can compensate you at the appropriate levels. We need to do that, but we need to get our enrollment base right so that we can have the revenue to do all those important things. And finally, we need to have ethically inspired leadership. We need to do the right things and, and be ethical, but inspired and transform the institution in the right direction toward that keystone goal. Okay, I'm gonna show you a few charts. Is that readable or is it hard to read? Hard to read in back? If you're in front, it's okay. This is uh, the percentage change in state revenue support from 2002 to today. So in that last decade, we've lost 15% of our state support. If you go back one more year, it gets to be over 20%. It's over $25 million that we've lost in that period. And that's non-inflation adjusted dollars. That's just raw dollars. So the cost of things have gone up and our state support's gone by $25 million. Not good. And do we anticipate that curve zooming back up? Not so much. No, the state faces a lot of financial challenges right now. As, as we all know, following the, the pension issues, uh, the state uh, tried to do a pension reform and it didn't seem to hold up in the courts. We'll have to see how it continues to play out in the courts. But there are gonna be more challenges there. There's more challenges in the state budget. Uh, they're still uh, delaying their payments to us by about a quarter, meaning the money that they owe us out of the state appropriation is coming in a quarter late. That causes cash flow problems as we meet the payroll and pay our bills, uh, where we've got to have enough cash even though they haven't given it to us. So that creates a very complex financial environment. All right, that's state support. This is the percentage change in enrollment since 2002. It's gone down over 15%. And that 15% trans translates into over 4,000 students. That's, that's a big drop. And uh, that's 4,000 souls who we have not worked with and transformed their lives and allowed them to go on and transform their families and their communities' lives. Uh, that's a moral commitment we have to the state and those students, and we need to turn that around uh, to fulfill our mission, to be the most student-centered uh, public research university in the Midwest. We, we need to do that. And, by the way, uh, 4,000 students not being here is uh, a lot of tuition revenue foregone. Uh, if you just do simple math, let's say $10,000 in tuition and fees, it's actually close to $12,000. But 10,000 times 4,000 students is $40 million that we don't have in our budget because of that drop. It makes a big impact. So 25 million from the state, 40 million from roughly from tuition, and plus room and board that I didn't even add in. Those are big numbers. And that's put a lot of strain on our budget. This is kind of a busy graph. Uh, it goes from at the bottom left from 1986 to 2013, and these are retention rates. These are the percentage of students that come back. So the blue line is the percentage of students who are freshmen that come back to be sophomores. In uh, 2004, we were at 79% coming back. Last year, we were at 66%. Big drop. 
the red line are the sophomores coming back as juniors and the green line are the juniors coming back as seniors. So you can see that our enrollment trends, our downward enrollment trends are not just a recruitment issue, they're a retention issue. They're that inclusion of students back here uh, to really embrace the university and get connected and have meaningful relationships and strong learning opportunities. That's why this uh, welcome days is so important. When I look at this graph and I think about including students and making them welcome and feel at home in this big university, we can do that, but we, we really have to take it on. And if we do that, we're going to fulfill our mission and our moral obligation, and we're going to affect our uh, economic engine that builds our budget for us and allows us to hire the faculty, staff, and, and compensate them. So these are pretty dramatic graphs. Now, we've had a dramatic drops in revenue. I didn't say much about what we spend our money on. We spend our money on 70% of our budget is on salaries, wages, salaries, benefits for faculty and staff at the university. So you might ask, how has employment changed in that time of dramatic revenue decline? Uh, the answer is not a lot. So if you look at these three bars, the blue bar uh, is faculty, relatively small change from uh, 2002 to 2012, or 2003 to 2012, uh, a small increase in SPS and a small decrease in um, civil service. If you add all those bars up, I think we're, as of 2012, we were 66 total employees different, even though we'd undergone tens of millions of dollars in reduction in revenue. So how did we close that gap? Any guesses? That revenue gap? Tuition went up. That's the big driver. We, we drove tuition up. <sighs> and when you increase your price, it turns out it makes it harder for students to come and stay at universities. So that may be another driver of that previous graph of students not staying. So part of it's financial. But when we talk with our students, an awful lot of it is social attachment. Most of the students that leave on these downward curves leave in good academic standing. They're not flunking out, they're leaving. And, the, and nine out of 10 that leave and go to another school go to a community college. That's kind of shocking, isn't it? That, that tells me that the, the economics of this are playing a role. They, uh, we may have financial aid for the first year, the second year gets expensive, I gotta go somewhere else, I'm gonna go to a community college or I'm not socially attached enough here to feel like it's worth me staying. I need to stay. I'm confident in our faculty and staff in this university. We got the chops. We have top-ranked programs. Uh, we, we have an amazing environment for our students. We have what it takes to transform those lives and do it uh, in, in a great way. Uh, but we need to embrace with the students, and we need to uh, attach them here and help them on with their lives and their careers. So. How do we do that? Um, we do it uh, through strategically focusing on what sometimes we call the, tri the triangle offense. So the triangle offense has on its three corners students, academics, and the world market. So this is indicating we just don't think about the relationship between faculty and academics. We think about the relevancy of what the students are doing and hook them out into the world out into the marketplace, whether they're gonna be in the public or private sectors. And that creates enriching environments, let's say through an internship that a student's doing out in an organization. And some of our uh, great programs here do that already. Uh, in education, we have pre-service teaching. Students are out for a year in schools, fantastic. Uh, uh, Masters of Public Administration requires a, a two-year half-time paid internship for their students, and they have almost 100% placement rate. Those students are highly sought after because of that relationship. And in, in that case, uh, our faculty are hooked up with the, the local governments and doing research with them. So you have that very strong triangle built that can make us distinctive. And in the center are all the support services. These are all the things that tie and strengthen that triangle. These are uh, facilities and HR and uh, IT, on and on. These are the things that bond us together and that make us stronger and make all these relationships uh, more effective. 
Uh, student attachment doesn't have to be with an academic. In fact, I suspect students form uh, maybe a majority of their bonds outside of the classroom with staff in the university that are helping them. Maybe it's an advisor. Maybe it's the person um, uh, that's cleaning on their floor. Uh, maybe it's somebody in financial aid that sat down and talked with them one day and helped them think about how they could stay in school. Uh, maybe it's somebody at the rec center who uh, is a friend with them. You know, these are the social attachments that all of us play in these various triangles up on that figure. Uh, and maybe uh, I should say a moment about the challenges that uh, I saw facing us here a year ago when I came in. Uh, these are dramatic changes. Uh, we were looking at uh, this spring at least a $15 million budget shortfall. And we've closed that. And we've closed it because we had great support uh, from our financial area. Uh, last fall, it, it was clear to me we didn't have a good budget, a good budget model, or a good budget process to allow us to think about how do we spend our money on the important stuff. And we needed to build that at the same time we're putting all those processes into place. And uh, so at that time, I did some reorganizing. I, I eliminated the vice president for finance and facilities position, subsequently eliminated the, the facilities vice presidency, and uh, did an interim, a search for an interim chief financial officer, and that's Nancy Suttonfield, who we hired last fall, who's done amazing work to put all these pieces together. This is hard, hard work putting all this together. Kind of like laying the tracks in front of the train while you're going down it. She's, she's doing that work and doing it in partnership with the provost, Lisa Freeman, and their staffs. And I'm just so very proud of what they've been able to accomplish this year. Uh, the original plan was Nancy would be th with us through the spring, and we did a national search to replace her, even though I'd love her to stay, but she's retired. Uh, but that search failed. Uh, we didn't have a strong pool, and I didn't want to hire uh, someone that wouldn't meet our needs. And so I asked Nancy to stay on uh, through the uh, December of this year. Uh, she agreed to do that, but she had other opportunities, and so I needed to compensate her. And that's been out in the press some. Why are you paying... Nancy so much money? And the answer is uh, I needed to keep her, we needed to keep her so we could move the institution forward. So I wanted to directly address that one. And also, uh, last year as I was coming in, it struck me we had some real strategic challenges. We have a very competitive market right now. We're competing against the elite schools at the top, like Illinois or Chicago, and their enrollments are going up, and students are paying full out-of-state tuition and in-state tuition there but the enrollments are going up because of that brand identity, and that's creating more revenue and allowing them to hire more faculty and staff and give raises, but they're on an upward enrollment, and we're competing against that because of their brand. I'm confident a student could get just as good an education, or maybe a better, probably a better education here because of our size and the dedication of our faculty and staff, but there's that brand that we're competing against, and at the other end, we've got community colleges who, with local taxing authority, have much lower tuitions, so we're in the middle somewhere in there, and we've got to think strategically, how do we move forward? Those are big questions, and we needed to go out and talk with stakeholders, our alumni, uh, our students, our faculty, our staff. We did that through the Bold Futures workshops. We did it through uh, meetings in colleges, with student groups, with alumni groups, et cetera. And the person that's helped me do that's been Ron Walters, and he was also in the newspaper with some discussion about his salary. When he came in in the fall, I asked him to work a portion of time, and it was clear we were making a lot of progress with all that work, like the Bold Futures workshops, and I asked him to do significantly more. And so his, uh, because he was working a lot more hours, uh, kind of night and day, I compensated him at the appropriate rate. I didn't raise his his uh, compensation rate, just the number of hours uh, he was working. And so that was also in the newspaper. And uh, um, I just wanted to get those two pieces out. You may want to follow up with questions on them. But I think those were two really important hires to turn us around in, in a point where we've got dropping enrollments, dropping state revenues, and increasing competition, and a budget system that we didn't have a full grip on. So that was the situation I thought we need to directly address. Now, as we turn the enrollment around, and I, there are some leading indicators that we can do that, uh, we're going to have the revenues, as Illinois or other, University of Illinois or others do, to increase our staffing and increase our compensation. I would like nothing more than that. 
Uh, this year, we focused a lot on that 66% retention rate we had. Uh, thank you for, did, how many participated in the Bold Futures workshops this year? Wow, thanks. Well, there was a lot of energy in those rooms. You came up with a lot of ideas, and it looks like this fall, our freshman retention is going to be up, and maybe up significantly. Well, no one tenth day. I hate to predict right now, because who knows what's going to happen between now and the tenth day. Uh, but the uh, leading indicators are retention is up, fantastic. Unfortunately, uh, overall enrollment's going to be down, uh, and we'll have to wait till tenth day. But it, we're, we're projecting we've built the budget on a down enrollment picture, and uh, we felt it was prudent to do that. Uh, we didn't want to get out of the headlights, overestimate our revenues, and then have to take pullbacks partway through the year. So we've built that model, and uh, we've closed that gap that big fiscal gap that we had, that $15 million gap, and we've done it without layoffs and without furloughs. So thank you to the, the fiscal team that's been working on to do that. Now, how did we do it? Well, we had a hiring freeze this year, and uh, we then had to refill positions, and so we had uh, hiring hearings, and we had those in academic affairs and all across the institution. And uh, they were brought to the cabinet level, they were worked through the appropriate council uh, committees. Uh, they were built on budget principles that the university uh, had built and uh, the Resource Planning and Budget Committee had uh, formally adopted. Uh, we did a lot of process work to make it right. And uh, the hires went into three categories, green, yellow, and red. Uh, we've opened up the green hires. The yellow, we're waiting to see what our actual revenue picture is on the 10th day. And the red, we've said no to. But through that process, we've balanced the budget, uh, again, without furloughs or layoff. So I'm proud of that work that you've done, and it's, it's been a tremendous effort, and uh, thanks to the team. Okay, so that's where we are. Now, how do we continue the positive trend? Well, we've got to get a grip on the enrollment issues, right? It's our moral obligation. It is our mission, and we've got to turn that around. And the first step in uh, a student's life is the first year here, and in the first year, it's the first semester, and in the first semester, it's the first month, and in the first month, it's the first week, and, and now we're down to welcome days. And we need to get off on the right foot, and we need to make this a big deal. Uh, can you imagine coming to NIU, and if you're from a small town in southern Illinois, you think this is the biggest place you've ever been in your life, and if you're from downtown Chicago, you can't believe you're out in a cornfield. Wherever you're coming from, you're coming to a new place. And can you remember when you started work here? You're probably a little bit uh, Twitter, too. And if you're coming here as an incoming freshman, this is, uh, oh, I don't know, this is uh, crazy. Could be a scary place. You don't know people. You don't have relationships. You don't know how you're going to do. You don't know how you're going to perform in higher education. So it's so important for all of our students to embrace them. So our approach with uh, Welcome Days this year represents an opportunity for all of us to work with our students to put our best foot forward. Uh, how we treat the students and their families as they come into this institution is going to have a lasting impact on them. And parents are a big deal, obviously. Uh, many of them are paying the bills. Probably most of them are paying the bills. Uh, how we treat them is hugely important. You know, if you're a first-year student, whether it be a transfer or a freshman, this is a whole new world, and you need to learn it. We need to get them off in the right direction. And if you're a returning student, uh, you're going to see a reinvigorated university. And we need to keep them here, because we see retention continues to be an issue, even for our upper division students. So uh, back to the interactions with our faculty and our staff at all levels and all departments and all divisions, you're going to make an impact. Our students tell us over and over in uh, interviews and focus groups that that is one of the key factors for them coming, staying, and succeeding. Uh, we want to integrate them into that Husky culture. Uh, our, pr our professors are world-renowned. Uh, they're renowned for their teaching, their research, and outreach activities. Uh, they love it, and the students value that training that they get, that education that they get, that wisdom that they get. Uh, staff, same thing. They form close personal bonds with staff members all over the university. Uh, that smallness that we can have at this university is really important. We're a big university full of uh, uh, really amazing faculty and staff. Uh, but we're small enough and have a culture enough where we can build that sense of community. And I think that's one of our real competitive advantages. And again, Welcome Days is a place to really reinforce that. Uh, 
So my thanks to all of you on the front line who've been working to get campus ready, who've been working on orientations this summer, who've been working on putting a budget together so we're balanced and uh, we're positive going forward. Uh, amazing amount of work this summer and in the last year to get us ready for this fall. Now, there are some interesting posters around campus. Have you seen these on the light poles and whatnot? Um, so we're going to have uh, new banners that welcome folks back to campus and re reinforce our cornerstone objective of student career success. Uh, we're going to have digital signage all across campus that will provide a steady stream of information about events in real time that will be of interest to them. Uh, we have new directional signage. Uh, you may have noticed uh, we don't have good directional signage on campus. Have you noticed? <laughs> Yay. I saw the art museums outside my building. I saw the sign. I said, wow. I, I knew it was there. But if, if you're from southern Illinois or downtown Chicago, how do you find your way around this joint? Well, you can ask. You can ask me, and people will help you. I hope you all got your Ask Me buttons and you wear them the next few weeks as students or wear them all year um, and, and help students answer their questions. So that's going to be wonderful. Uh, uh, mobile communications, uh, we're going to have featuring a new mobile app that we'll, uh, we'll have for welcome days and an icon to help reinforce the information they'll f find on campus. We'll have student ambassadors around campus who, as always, will be available to take questions and deal with issues. And, uh, and we'll have events aimed at engaging parents as well as students to make them feel welcome and reinforce the wisdom of their decisions to come here. Uh, later, uh, in a few weeks actually, we're going to have a Google app. Is it a Google-based? A Google-based uh, navigation tool. So you know when you plug in, how do I get to Sycamore in your phone, and it shows you the map on how to get there? We're going to have one of those on campus. So if you say, how do we get from Holmes to Revis? It'll show you, and you can follow it. So that'll be kind of cool for incoming students. I find. I've only been here a year. There's one or two buildings where I'll have to go look. Wh which one is that? Is it the one there or the one next door? And I, I've got to go figure it out where it is. It'd be nice to have the app. Hopefully we don't bump into each other while we're looking at our phones walking around. I was downtown in Chicago a couple weeks ago, and I was trying to find where I was going, and a bicyclist almost ran over me, and then he said, excuse me, Dr. Baker. <laughs> it was kind of a creepy moment, actually. <laughs> Oh, Sean, I was going into a Dunkin' Donuts downtown, by the way. That's, Sean comes with a Dunkin' Donuts coffee every day. All right. Um, we're going to make sure that all of our students uh, know that all of us are here to help because uh, we're wearing these buttons that I mentioned. Uh, in addition, a cross-section of people will be featured on the banners, the digital signage, and the slides of campus uh, uh, buses, uh, making that promise as well. Uh, featuring our own people all over campus. Uh, I think it's important to feature our people who really are the heart and soul of what we do here in helping students be successful. Uh, let me say a few words about the people here on the pictures. Uh, there's Sergeant uh, Jason Wright over there, uh, NIU, NIU police. Jason grew up in DeKalb before playing Div Division I college basketball. He's worked at NIU since 2005, starting as an academic coordinator in athletics. And uh, Jason's been with the NIU police in public safety for eight years, first as an officer and now as a sergeant, covering internal affairs and special events. Is Jason here? I didn't see him when I came in. Well, he's right there. Uh, Bill Heal, NIU Grounds. Hi, Bill. Is, he's got the greatest, is Bill here? He's got the greatest smile in the world. Uh, Bill's worked at NIU for 30 years, and he says that uh, he, uh, he has the best job on campus creating an attractive, enjoyable, and safe environment for students, faculty, staff, and visitors. As a greenhouse gardener, he grows 90% of the flowers on campus from seed. Uh, any guess on how many that is? 23,000. He's, he's got a green thumb. So uh, he beautifies campus. And you know, curb appeal plays a big deal in, in how people respond to a campus. And we're working hard on that. You, I, thanks so much to the grounds folks who've been working to beautify campus. It, it, it looks really great.
Bonnie. Uh, uh, Bonnie Webb is a cashier for in the Bursar's office. Bonnie is a lifelong DeKalb resident who's worked in the Bursar's office for 15 years. Uh, she sometimes gets questions from students about their bill, believe it or not, and uh, can often be found explaining how financial aid impacts the student billing and the students and really helps educate them. That's a lifelong thing we need to learn, how to manage our own finances. So thank you to Bonnie. Uh, Sherry Adams. Uh, Sherry's worked uh, for four years at NIU, all in parking services. Uh, she's lived in DeKalb from 1984 until she moved next door to Cortland two years ago. She says uh, the keys to making the customer the number one priority is to listen and then provide services in a professional manner that reflects NIU's values. That's a hard job. I got a parking ticket and I don't like it. <laughs> now, how that person is treated in parking is going to reflect on the whole university. And that's a hard job. That's a tough skill. That's customer service that can make a huge impact. So uh, I don't envy her this job. This is a hard job, and, and thank her for the way she conducts it. Uh, Rich Holly, is Rich here? Yeah. Ta dump dum. <laughs> Hi, Rich. Uh, since coming to NIU in 1983, he doesn't look that old, does he? Uh, Rich has served NIU as a professor of percussion, associate dean, and now the dean of the College of Visual and Performing Arts, where he and his talented faculty and staff focus on engaging approximately 1,600 majors in art, music, theater, and dance. Thank you for your leadership of that college. Appreciate it. And uh, finally, Sylvia, Sylvia Flowers, graduate assistants, uh, student support services. You know, uh, we need to update this banner. After working in student financial aid office since 2009 as a student worker, and then after graduation, uh, Sylvia recently joined student support services over in Adams Hall as a graduate assistant as she pursues her master's degree in adult and higher education. So congratulations and thanks to her. You know, the, these are the human stories. These are the people that interact with each of us and with our students that make a difference and build that husky culture. Um, also, uh, you know, that hus husky culture needs to be one of safety. Uh, this year in the Bold Futures workshops, we asked students about concerns they had. Uh, we talked to eight, 900 students about concerns they had at the university that might affect their retention. At, at the top of the list was advising. Interesting. At the bottom of the list, was safety. Isn't that interesting? Now there's a public perception about our safety on campus. Uh, the statistics don't support concerns about it, but we do need to do everything we can about public safety. And uh, there's a national uh, issue right now that's on, on boiling for good reason, and, and that's about uh, sexual abuse. Uh, this is a big deal at the national level. The White House formed a task force to study it. There were two higher education lawyers involved in those discussion, and one was Jerry Blakemore, our general counsel. Is Jerry here? Uh, Jerry, thank you so much for working on that and, and helping guide that conversation. Uh, it's an important issue. Uh, uh, reading that report as it came out and talking with Jerry uh, over the summer as it was uh, being developed and emerged, it struck me we need to be a national leader in this, part of the ethically inspired leadership pillar. Uh, we need to have a safe environment for all of our students. And so I formed a task force co-chaired by Vice President Leslie Rigg and Eric Weldy and with students, faculty, staff uh, participation. And their purpose is to make recommendations to us on how to respond to the new federal mandates about sexual abuse prevention, counseling, enforcement, and reporting. Let's get ahead of it. Uh, this is a national issue, and, and we want to be on the forefront. And as students move in this week, it's a vulnerable time. So let's uh, really double down on our vigilance in helping students and making sure it's a safe place for them. And if uh, tragically something happens, let's be there for them and do the right thing to help them through it. So uh, thank you to all those committee members for taking that on. Speaking of Eric, um, Eric joined the same time I did a year ago. And he came from that little school called Florida State, who the year before we played in the Orange Bowl, and we decided to steal him from down there. And I'm so happy he came home. He grew up in Joliet, P2 
Peoria. Oh, yeah, sorry, Peoria. I keep screwing that up. Peoria. And he's come home, and he's doing a wonderful job in enrollment management. And he and his staff have worked a lot on thinking about how do we get students and their families off on the right foot. Uh, the, the feedback from the Bold Futures workshops was that was a big deal, and we need to pay attention to it. And Eric and his crew have taken that on in earnest. And uh, you're going to be amazed at all the stuff that's going on. It's not just the banners. It's not just the pins. It's the activities of the week. And Eric, could you come up and share some of that with us? Let's go back. You got it. And hit that guy right there. I'll do it for you. Right. Get it. Yeah, Here, sorry about this. Jay set it up so he wouldn't screw it up. <laughs> uh, that happens. I'm glad uh, President Baker uh, brought out his phone. And so I'm curious, how many of you have the NIU app on your phone? Okay, if you don't, don't be in embarrassed. You need to get it, like now. <laughs> uh, uh, on your app, on your NIU app, what you'll find is you'll find um, a link uh, to welcome days uh, on, on the app. And so uh, I'll go through some of the activities uh, that we have planned for welcome days. So don't feel like you have to take notes or anything. They're on your app. They're also on the website. Uh, but uh, very excited about this opportunity that we have. Now if I can adjust this, he's a little bit taller than I am. Uh, Welcome Days was established to bring members of the NIU community together to celebrate the start of the new academic year. It not only gives us a chance to welcome new students to the NIU community, but all faculty, staff, and students. In other words, Welcome Days is for all Huskies. We are encouraging everyone to come out and participate. Welcome Days has become a part of our tradition at NIU. Through our programs and activities, it also allows us to introduce new or incoming students to the campus. Studies show that students who build relationships with faculty, staff, and students become actively engaged and become actively engaged in the campus community are more likely to stay in school and continue their studies through, no, through, uh, through to graduation. And that's what we're looking to do. We're, we're looking to have our students become actively engaged on campus to build relationships so that they can call NIU their, their home. Welcome Days is also a collaborative effort between the Division of Student Affairs and Enrollment Management, Academic Affairs, Marketing and Communications, Athletics, and other partners throughout the university community. One thing that I have learned throughout my career that if you're going to do student affairs, if you're going to serve students, you can't do it alone. And so it takes, it takes a community in order to serve students. And I think that that's exactly what we're doing here at NIU. Uh, in this presentation, I will highlight some of the special events taking place during Welcome Days, which will kick off on Friday, August 22nd, and continue on through the first week of classes. Uh, this year, Welcome Days is taking on a new look we have incorporated a few changes throughout the week in an effort to make it a true Husky family celebration. So let's take a look at what we have planned in the coming days. Uh, this year, the NIU uh, Steel Drum Band, actually, let me back up here. Um, one of the changes we have made to Welcome Days is asking faculty and staff to join President Baker and our new students uh, in the band run. President Baker will gather with students, faculty, and staff as they march their way to the Convocation Center to take part in the Husky Family Welcome. And I do believe that at some point they're going to uh, learn the alma mater. And so it'll, it'll be interesting. So I don't know about you, but uh, I definitely will be there to, uh, to see that. Uh, some of you may recognize the Husky Family Welcome by its former name, the Academic Convocation. This year we are making this event a true family affair. For the first time, students with their families uh, have been asked to join us at the Convocation Center. 
What better way for new students to kick off the start of their college career? I have to tell you that during orientation, uh, we asked uh, uh, families if they would be interested in participating uh, in uh, the Husky Family Welcome. And so after the first week, I think we had like 300. And then the second week, we had like 1,000. And then the third week, I pretty much passed out. <laughs> because we were looking to feed them. And so uh, my, my hope is <laughs> that, uh, that we'll have about between two and 3,000 uh, families there. And so I think it'll be an exciting time. Speaking of the Husky family, welcome. Uh, this year, uh, the NIU Steel Drum Band will be uh, performing at the Husky family welcome, making this event a true celebration. Did any of you attend graduation? All right, the NIU still band performed at graduation. I must admit, I was up on stage dancing. I was grooving. Now, my wife doesn't think I'm a great dancer, but hey, you know, I like to think that I am. <laughs> For the first time, we will also highlight some of the wonderful opportunities current NIU students have had to collaborate with faculty on research and other projects. This will allow uh, this will allow us to showcase some of our academic programs and the hands-on experience students gain when they become actively engaged. Those featured will include a faculty member and student from the Department of Physics, the School of Music, and the NIU Forensics team, which is a part of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences General Studies program. A couple of the students will also perform as part of the program. This is not your regular academic convocation. And so for, the, for those of you uh, faculty members who really did not want to walk in the robes, there will be no robes, there will be t-shirts, there will be jeans, there will be tennis shoes. And so we're looking to have a great time. The Northern Pact was first adopted at NIU during the fall semester of 2008. Uh, the Northern Pact is, is, uh, will, has been our focus uh, at the Husky Family Welcome, the event now known as Husky Family Welcome, for the past uh, several years. And so we will continue uh, that tradition this year. Uh, its principles are one of the ways uh, we have worked uh, to help build community at NIU. The principles are based on the work of Dr. Ernest Boyer, who, for the Carnegie uh, Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, conducted a study of community as it related to college and university campuses. Surveying college and university presidents, Dr. Boyer developed six principles that, de defi that define the kind of community every college and university should strive to be. Uh, in the past six years, we have highlighted one of the six principles. Uh, this year, we are focusing on all six principles, which you can see on the slides above. And something else, too, is our new students will have an opportunity to, to wear um, uh, Northern Pack t-shirts. And so you see those around. I've been seeing them already uh, over the past couple of weeks. And so uh, this, is, this is an opportunity for us to join together and really uh, build a strong community. Uh, to learn uh, more about NIU, our new students will have a chance to see firsthand what programs and services they can uh, become actively engaged both on and off campus. Some of the programs and services uh, to be highlighted include uh, Campus Recreation and TLC, the theme learning communities. Uh, the Saturday of Service event will give, give those students who are interested uh, a chance to volunteer with the DeKalb community. Volunteers will be working with the DeKalb uh, County Community Gardens or DeKalb's local soup kitchen, which is called uh, Feed'em Soup uh, Community Project. Uh, join the Saturday of Service kickoff and home base in the Home Student Center's Capital Room. Materials and transportation will be provided for services uh, and, and experiences. Additional fun events uh, also include, for the, the coming uh, week, uh, include Shift NIU, which is a cookout that is hosted by the off-campus, non-traditional, and student services uh, area, uh, the Minimalist team, and the Glow in the Dark dance party. I don't know how many of you have attended a Glow in the Dark uh, dance party, but it seems kind of fun. And so I think, I, I think I'll be there. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, all are welcome to attend the second annual President's Picnic. How many of you attended the President, President's Picnic uh, last year? Well, I, I understand it's going to be bigger and better. We'll be on the East Lagoon. And uh, I heard rumors about a zip line. I heard rumors about a kayak and canoes. And so apparently uh, the lagoon is uh, free for a pleasure. <laughs> and so, uh, so I think everybody will be looking uh, forward to coming out and having fun on the East Lagoon. Uh, throughout the week, the academic colleges uh, will be hosting special receptions that will allow students to meet with faculty. Student career success really begins in the classroom. Therefore, it is important that our students get connected with faculty early on. And here are a list of, of, of the receptions. And this will occur uh, throughout the first week of classes. Okay, finally, uh, get your first taste of NIU game day. Uh, relax with uh, your new friends and members of the university community while enjoying a great tailgate style dinner in Central Park. And I believe that this is new. Uh, Central Park is located between Grant and Stevenson's uh, uh, residences. Uh, join the Husky Marching Band, Victor E. Husky, the Spirit Squad, and, and more to display what it means to commit to NIU. Welcome Days is an opportunity for us to, as I noted, welcome our new students, but it's also a time for us to celebrate our campus community, every aspect of our campus community, uh, whether it's academics, athletics, you name it. And so I don't know about you, but I'm very excited about what's ahead for us. Uh, welcome Days is only the beginning. Let's make it the beginning of a great year, and go Huskies. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eric. A lot of thanks for all that prep work, and I think it's going to be a great rollout. So now, open to questions. Uh, questions online, at the microphone, wherever you want to go. So let's let's start there, and then uh, Brad, why don't you monitor the website, and we'll call up what we need for Eric, me, any of the leadership. So here we go. Want to start? Who's first? These guys are holding the mics for us, I guess. Oh. All right, there we go. President Baker, uh, members of the university community, my name is Stephen Halixer. Some of you may know me from the community, others as a longtime faculty member here at NIU, others as a presidential research professor. Um, I've been retired for a number of years. Um, I accepted uh, initially, thinking rather foolishly, Eric Weldy's. Um, invitation to join the science committee, the campus signage planning team. And we've had a number of meetings and um, very happy I joined. It's, it's a bunch of very creative, committed people. I'd like to extend a little bit on some of the president's remarks related to signage on this campus. Uh, I've been here a long, long time, many decades. And uh, like many of you, I have encountered on numerous occasions uh, forlorn students, lost um, parents of visitors who have stopped and asked me, please, sir, can you tell me where this building or how I get here or how I get there? And I've tried to advise them and tell them, and my wife, Deborah Halix, has had many of the same experiences, and many of you have the same experiences. And the signage on this campus has been abysmal. So one of the problems that's been allowed to fester through several presidential administrations. Um, previous uh, planning exercises, for example, the Great Journeys uh, strategic planning exercise uh, in 2005 have called for radical improvements in wayfinding and signage. Nothing has been done. Under this president, this problem has been tackled, partially through this committee. And if you look around campus, you're going to find signs in front of buildings. These are banners. This is only the first stage, because this committee is going to be going on and continuing to improve our signage and wayfinding on this campus. You're going to find banners that tell you the names of the different buildings. Some buildings on campus have never had a sign on them of any kind. 
Uh, my wife and I, a few weekends ago, went around, walked around every single building on this campus taking pictures. Yes. And we found... Was this like a date or something? <laughs> Was it, was, it Deb? It was a, a date. This is a hot date in DeKalb. It was a hot date that, that resulted in some really good exercise and some really good photographs because we have dozens and dozens of photographs of the signage disaster and signage desert that is NIU, or was NIU, was NIU. Point being that you know, we've had buildings like Anderson Hall with no sign at all of any kind, not even on the... Um, the, the entranceways, nothing, there's zero signage on this enormous building. Uh, Faraday has no signage. Um, if you go around campus now, you're going to see these banners popping up with signs telling you what buildings there are. And we have wayfinding now. But this is just the beginning. We're going to have, this committee is going to be ongoing, and we're going to help departments, and we're going to help colleges with other issues related to telling people, what they're doing, what's in the building, what can be done, and so on and so forth. Now, not only that, we have a very important initiative called the um, Campus Bird Interactive Map. Now, uh, President Baker mentioned this, but I just want to make a point. We can customize this map. This is being used at a number of over 100 colleges and universities in the United States. We can customize this map and make it our own. We can do a great many things with this map, but this is the beginning of an initiative that I think is extremely important, and that is the beginning of augmented reality on the NIU campus. Uh, and I think we can do a great deal more with that, and we can do that, again, through this committee and other initiatives. So I'd just like to compliment President Baker on his leadership in this very important area of finding a way around, where to go, what to do, uh, what building is this? Very important for you know, uh, visitors, students, alumni, anyone who comes to campus. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> President Baker. President Baker, I've got a card that was submitted. If we could you yeah. to address that before Hit somebody comes up. So uh, um, this was submitted from uh, the audience here. With the buses being moved to the east side, and that's the Husky bus line moving to the east side of the Home Student Center on Normal Road. Where can HSC employees be dropped off or picked up from? May we now use the west side of Home Student Center, which used to be the bus turnaround? I haven't been in that conversation. It's an interesting uh, question. Has anybody been on that committee that's doing that planning? Probably something we should look at. A bill. Can we thank Bill for uh, his service at the university? And, well, how about that? Uh, Look what you started, Brad. <laughs> well, that, that's really nice. Thank you for thanking Bill. Let me just say something about him before he, uh, let's see if his answer is good. We should, <laughs> maybe we should applaud him after the answer. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I, I've appreciated working with Bill this year. Um, he puts in an awful lot of hours, uh, as you may know. He's, he's here early and he goes home late and whenever there's an emergency, he's on call. So he's done an enormous amount. He, he, he did come to me this spring and said, I blocked a week for my grandbabies, they're in town. And then at the end of the week, he said, I worked every day. Not good. So I wish you well with your, your grandbabies and your family. You know, I, we aspire to be in your shoes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, the answer to the question uh, is yes. Uh, this is a bit of an experiment uh, as uh, the next couple of days unfold, we are shifting the buses over. And where is Brett? Where did I see There's Brett? And do you know? OK. OK, and uh, Brett Williams, uh, please, uh, our, our Director of Transportation and Student Association. And 
we, uh, we threw him a curve by uh, doing this pretty quickly this summer, and he's, <laughs> and he's been up to the challenge, and Joe Frisello is here too, I believe, the former director and now the SA president, and he's been working with Brett and others. Uh, we're we're going to make the shift then uh, effective on the 25th, and uh, as of right now, you can still drop people off on the east side, but when the shift occurs, there will be room to do that on the west side. There may still be some Husky buses pulling into the west side if there is a lineup on the east side that exceeds the room that we've created. You may have noticed some concrete has been poured and that will hopefully accommodate up to eight buses. Uh, but some of the routes have more than one bus and uh, so there may be intermittent things that we're going to work on and figure out. And uh, so I hope that's an Sufficient answer yep, at this that's point. That's good, thanks. And uh, when we did that design charrette this year and talked to students about things we could do on campus, uh, most of them uh, said that the buses being over here uh, in the wind tunnel when it was 20 below was not a good idea. And uh, you can see how that wind hits uh, the top of the tower and then shoots down and creates you know, a really windy, cold area. And uh, this side with the nice covered walkway out to the bus area, I think is going to be a much more welcoming environment. And the building should block the wind instead of create a vortex down on top of them. So let's experiment and see if this works. If it doesn't, we'll think about something else. But let's give it a shot. Who else had a question? Yeah. I know wages is a hot topic. Can you hear me? Uh, say, say it again. What? I know wages is a very hot wages, topic. Wages, yes, good. And it's not just your problem, it's all our problem. And I hear that we can help fix that problem by welcoming our students and engaging them and making them want to come back. And I know we all have it in us to do that because we have a heck of a lot of heart around here, a heck of a lot of dedicated employees. Um, you know, and we can choose to stay negative or we can choose to be positive and try to inspire change around us and in others and it will flood over to the students. But I want to ask you just from an emotional standpoint from you, how do you feel about some of the lower wages that you know are being paid here? Uh, I don't feel good about them at all. And uh, this last uh Oh, into the first semester, we were looking at our numbers, and I was trying to figure out, was there any way inside the budget that we had at that time to do a mid-year increase? And um, we did modeling. And that was at the time as we were coming into the legislative session, we didn't know what the fiscal environment was. As you probably know, the governor submitted two budgets, a recommended and a not recommended budget. Uh, the not recommended budget was assuming that the income tax would actually go away as the law currently says it will go away. And in that budget, to balance it, he cut us 12.5%. That was another, what was that, Nancy, $20 million, $15 million? What was it? $15 million, an, an additional $15 million budget cut. And we didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, that and the declining enrollments, we said, uh, our budget's just too much out of whack to, to take that risk. I'd hate to give raises and then lay off a bunch of people to balance a budget. That doesn't make sense. So we, we didn't go forward, and I'm sad we didn't, but we need to do that. And so my hope is that our enrollment turns out better than our conservative projections and that we can relook at the balance sheet in this, uh, in this academic year or in the coming year and get those salaries up. You're absolutely right. If we can build uh, on the great Husky culture we have, engage our students, get the enrollments up on recruitment and retention, we will turn around the fiscal situation and the compensation will follow. So we, that's the plan. Thank you. Um, President Baker, we have a question from Adobe Connect Online, and it's kind of in line with funding. Uh, many universities receive considerable operating funds from athletics, donor gifts, and alumni slash general fund about these contributions and their role in our financial success? Uh, a great question. So uh, we've had one capital campaign, that's the term for a fundraising campaign, in uh, the university's history. Uh, we're, uh, and it was successful, and we did some great things with it. But now we're poised to go to the next one. Um, and capital campaigns can focus on people, supporting the faculty and staff of the university, place physical facilities, and given that the state has uh, not been giving us capital construction dollars, we kind of have to look at donors to help us do that. 
and uh, programs. This is all the support that we need to have for programming in the university. So people, place, and programs. And then finally, students. The support of students through scholarships and uh, internships and that kind of thing. Uh, we are preparing for another capital campaign. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Mike Malone has served this university for a career and uh, two years ago announced his retirement and he is now in his final year, so we're about to kick off a search there. I'll uh, be uh, naming a committee shortly with that and we'll get on with it. And <clears throat> thank Mike for his great service. That next Vice President for Advancement is gonna have as a major uh, focus of their work the capital campaign and those categories we just talked on. So to prepare for that, we've been looking at our donor base, we're looking at uh, what the opportunities are there, uh, we're looking at who the high, medium, and low donors may be, um, we're looking at how we need to staff that so we're not leaving money on the table, so to speak, that we're not contacting people that really wanna help us, and uh, then we're looking at uh, how do we execute that campaign. So that is on the forefront of my mind, uh, and that's in all areas, it's not just athletics, and it's not um, just academics, it's student services, it's the whole institution. And uh, my touring around this state and around the country talking with alumni uh, indicates they're ready. They want to help. There are a lot of deep, warm feelings about this institution and uh, many very successful people who've graduated from here. So we've, we've got the base. There are not very many schools who have 200,000 alumni within an hour's drive of their campus, or an hour and a half drive of their campus. We are, that's a competitive advantage for fundraising, but also for internships and mentoring. 200,000 people, most of them want to help. They want our students to succeed. We, they want our faculty and staff to succeed. So huge opportunity there. A question from the audience, President Baker. Will there be an effort, an organized one, to step up, create, and support mentor relationships between staff and students? Uh, yes, and I see pockets of that going on. Eric, do you want to talk about that? Eric's been, uh, and Lori Ellish Piper is also here, and Joe Maddy have been a trio running a committee looking at internships and mentoring programs. Do you want to do it, or since you're up here? Where's Lori? Oh, there's Lori. If he doesn't get it right, tell us. Here, use this one. They gave you the bad one. Okay. All right, now we're working. Um, uh, last year we did a pilot study, uh, a student alumni mentorship program. Uh, it was a collaborative effort between uh, my division, uh, between academic affairs, as well as the Alumni Association. And so uh, it, I think it was a great success. Uh, we initially wanted to have about 25 students and 25 alumni, and we ended up with over 60 students and definitely 60 plus alumni. And so we learned a lot. Uh, we did an assessment. Uh, and then President Baker asked from the standpoint that we focus on internships, giving our student internship opportunities. Definitely a lot of internship opportunities uh, for our students across campus through the academic programs uh, and also with the uh, organizations and companies off campus. But we, need, we needed to figure out how to coordinate that effort. And so the President uh, asked myself, asked Lori, uh, Ellish Piper and Joe Maddy uh, to come together and to create, uh, you know, uh, a, a program in, in which we can incorporate all of these things together. And so we submitted a proposal. We've gone through a few drafts. I don't know if you know this, but the president, he asked a lot of good questions. And that sends you back to the drawing board and uh, so that you can get it right. And so we're working on that. And I also know that uh, there are other initiatives uh, throughout the campus community. But that's, that's the start. Staff student, uh, Lori could probably speak on that a little bit more. Thank you. Um, I was a little late getting here. I came from the peer mentor training, so we've got peer mentoring going on as well if we think of the continuum. And faculty and staff are an important component of that. The first and second year experience office runs a program called Student Faculty Links. And it's an opportunity to connect um, faculty and staff members who volunteer to serve as a mentor for new students, whether those are freshmen or new transfer students. So if you are a staff member or a faculty member who is interested um, in that, I'm not sure if they're still accepting people to sign up, but I would assume they probably would be. 
Um, but um, you can feel free to drop me an email, lauriep at niu.edu, or if you go to the first and second year experience, um, you can click on a tab for the um, Student Faculty Links program. And I know they're doing a big kickoff event the first week of classes. It includes ice cream. So we're hopeful that all the mentees will come and probably a lot of the faculty and staff mentors as well. Um, but I think that's a great question because we all care about our student success. And so when we're thinking about mentoring, I think all of us um, could probably find time in our schedules to mentor and be um, a guide, just a touch point, just an encourager for some of our students. Any follow-ups on those answers? Any other questions here in the audience? Brad, I think you're still on. Um, this one uh, retains to, uh, to faculty. Uh, we can't retain students without great faculty. Uh, how many faculty have to retire um, before tenure lines are reopened? Uh, I think this goes back to uh, my, uh, my discussion of the budget and balancing the budget, and we arrayed all the faculty and staff lines, and uh, most were in the green, let's rehire category. Then there was the yellow, we gotta see what the budget's really gonna be once 10th day comes, and then the red ones. And so it's, it's uh, uh, it went, a, a big process went, was gone through in uh, the academic affairs arena. Uh, Leslie, would you mind, or Lisa, would you mind talking a little bit about the process that you went through in academic affairs to prioritize those hires and, and uh, where, where we got to with that. As President Baker said, we looked at the overarching goals, student career success, thriving communities, ethically inspired leadership, and most importantly, fiscal sustainability. And we looked at things that we know impact the student experience and retention, and also things that impact excellent academic programs. We generated uh, the uh, academic Council, which includes the deans and staff members from the provost office, as well as representatives from other divisions. And we developed a set of criteria um, that have different priorities that we would use as a lens to look at positions. Um, we asked each dean to make a presentation for their colleges, and I'm, an I'm answering this from the academic standpoint because that was the question. Um, the provost office supported them, giving them any data that they asked for related to enrollment, related to publications and national impact, related to community relationships, because relationships are resources. Each dean made a presentation. Um, those data were taken back by the provost office. Um, we did our best ranking of um, those positions given uh, the priorities and criteria that were agreed upon. Those were then um, reflected back to the deans so that the deans could tell us if there was anything we missed because we understand that the closer you are to the situation, the more you may understand what an immediate need is. We also presented that list of positions prioritized according to the criteria to a joint committee of the Academic Planning Council of University Council and the Resource Space and Budget Committee of University Council. And we didn't ask them to vote on the ranking of the positions, but we asked them the way the positions have been ranked and the criteria that were used to achieve that. Is that aligned with the university mission? statement. Is it aligned with the overarching goal of student career success and the three pillars? And is it aligned with the resource space and budget committee's statement of budget priorities, which was presented to and passed by university council? And their comments were overwhelmingly in an anonymous poll that it was aligned. While we were going through this process, and it was a process that was done with some urgency because of our budget situation and the large structural deficit, the state of Illinois threw a little bit of a wrench in the works um, with what you can only describe as massive confusion over retirement calculations, um, pension reform. And we went through a period where our list of vacancies was changing on a daily basis as people who have served this university for such a long time as such great faculty members felt forced to retire to preserve their benefits, and then contemplated unretiring because they felt they didn't have the most appropriate information to make a decision. All of this was happening as we got quite late in the academic year, and we had to make decisions about instructional staffing for the fall. We had to tell our instructors 
who was going to be hired. We had to figure out how we would meet the demand that students create. And so even if we had um, refilled every single tenure line, we would have been in a crisis that required a lot of creativity to get appropriate people in front of our students in the classroom this fall. We're working through the positions right now. President Baker referred to yellow-lighted positions to determine which will be the first that we release, in what order, as we clarify our budget situation and find additional funds. All of us wish that we could refill every vacant position with a faculty member as excellent as the one that retired, or at least in most cases, we really do strongly wish that. And we're working towards that end. But I think we also have to realize that as we look at our program priorities and we look at the vacant positions, there's also an opportunity to think about will this scenario allow us to do things differently, better, more creatively, um, look at our hiring as a way to promote more innovation in our curriculum, promote greater research excellence, and we're also having those conversations and encouraging those conversations. A lot of process with a very complex budget, uh, and thanks again for getting us balanced. It, it's, it does cause stress when you make those reductions, but we had to do that to get us back in line. Um, and, and we did it, so I'm proud, I'm proud that, uh, of all the hard work they did to get us there. Others? President Maker, there a couple of people have submitted some uh, questions both online and through the cards on what are we doing uh, with uh, online programs uh, to compete against uh, you know, for-profits and then also other institutions that offer that. Uh, that's a great question. Online education is a very competitive world these days. And uh, the prices charged go from zero to really high. And so at the zero end, you've got the massive open online classes, the MOOCs that you've probably heard about. Uh, it's been interesting to watch the tide kind of go out on MOOCs in the last year or so. So the business model there is you invest 30, 40, 50 million dollars as a, a big elite university and you create a whole bunch of free online classes and then you don't charge people for them. That's the business model. <laughs> so I don't think we're going to play in exactly that space. It turns out that if we're going to do it, we have to have some revenue to pay for it, right? So in the uh, revenue generating side of the online world, there's heavy competition, whether it be the for-profits like the University of Phoenix or Arizona State University that's doing some really interesting and innovative things with uh, business relationships, not just individual students. Uh, did you see what they did with uh, Starbucks, ASU and Starbucks, a few weeks ago? Uh, they signed a deal where if you worked half-time at Starbucks, you got free online tuition at ASU. Wow. That's cool. So, uh, and Starbucks had been struggling some with their image, and now they're a cool place because of that. Now, they estimate that'll be about 15,000 students taking online courses that Starbucks will pay for. That's, maybe that's an opportunity for us to have these business-to-business -business relationships. Now, we've got an amazing city just down the street, and uh, we, we could have pretty amazing relationships there, but we've got to figure out what's our business plan and our competitive advantage, because there's people out in front of us in this regard right now. And you can go out and offer stuff, but you know it's, it's a competitive world. So we've got to think about how many people are there, uh, are they willing to take our stuff? How would we serve them well, both academically and then with student services, financial aid? We've got to have all those pieces put together so we don't go spend a, much of, a bunch of money and then lose a bunch of money because we don't get the enrollments. So we're looking at strategic opportunities. It turns out in most cases, there are the physical borders of a state aren't a barrier. So you could be taking a class from uh, Athabasca in Canada really, I think they have 40,000 students or something online, and uh, wouldn't even be in the same country, didn't matter. But there are some uh, boundaries where your brand, and we have a good brand and a number of uh, programs, can really give you a competitive advantage. And f us being physically close also gives us the opportunity to do some kinds of hybrid learning, where we could have, uh, say, weekend courses downtown or one of our branch campuses, uh, as well as the online component. So we have some competitive advantages where we could be very successful there. 
So that was kind of a long-winded way of saying we need to do it, but we need to do it smart so that we're spending our money to create revenue that allows us to build our faculty and staff and comp some, comp uh, compensate them appropriately for doing that work, not just drain more and ask us to do more without the concomitant revenues. So that's where we're headed with it. And uh, this year we've been working on uh, integrating our online support systems. And um, I'm uh, really thinking that those efforts are going to help us be more successful in helping faculty get stuff online. OK, Fred? Uh, you talked about a little bit about retention data uh, earlier here in, in the town hall. And we've had a couple of questions online and both that were submitted um, about specific retention goals. And the question is, what is the specific retention goal for the university this year or overall? At our leadership retreat uh, last month, uh, we put up the, the retention data and we showed, for example, uh, freshman to sophomore retention last year was 66%. And, and then within that, we noted that about 10% of the students left after the first semester and 20% left in the se after the second semester. So uh, Eric and Ron and some others did some calculations and said, hey, if we cut that in half, let's say we only lost 5% in the fall, what would the, be the revenue impact in the spring? Be about three million bucks. Well, that's good. So we worked with the leadership team and I think we came to the conclusion that let's set that as a goal. Let's try and increase by 5% our fall to spring retention rate. And if that happens, then we've got some additional revenues that we can spend on important stuff like all of us. So uh, that's our goal. And uh, we're going to be working through the colleges. We're coming back October 3rd for another leadership retreat where we're going to work on a draft strategic plan and then some of these implementation ideas. And I know many of the deans and chairs and other administrators from around the university have gone back after that leadership retreat and are working on this. What are the, what are the things we need to do in our part of the organization to help that retention number? It's not just about money. I mean, at the core, it's about what our mission is and what we're doing for our students. I mean, that, that's got to be our driving goal. Let's do the right thing for our students. And if we do that, what we're passionate about, what our mission is, the numbers will follow. And then we'll be able to do more and more and be on that positive upward spiral. So that's the goal. 5% on top of whatever we got this fall. Let's, let's increase it 5% into the spring. And if we can get another 5% then, I guess it was 5 and 5. It was spring and fall was $3 million. That's what it was. I overstated it. That was a whole year revenue enhancement. So that's the goal. Got another one. This one's pretty specific. There's a movement going on with organic, healthy eating and concerns with ingredients in, consumed in our food. Will NIU ever, and in the future, take steps toward a more healthy, organic, whole, few, whole foods approach on campus? It's not a bad idea. I need to do that, actually, personally. Uh, let's see. Is Mike here? Mike staying? He's not here. Anybody from a uh, die? Oh, there he is. Mike, do you want to talk about this? Here, there's a mic right there. Mike, Mike. Uh, yes, I would assume that we would probably tackle that once the new procurement director gets here. I know there's a lot of discussion about how we're going to begin the procurement process. And uh, I know that there's also a number of subgroups working across campus that are looking at this food distribution issue. Uh, uh, and so both on campus and in the community. And so I, I think it's certainly something that seems to be a movement heading in that direction where we will continue to take a look at that. And uh, by the way, uh, Mike, why don't you do a pitch here? Uh, <laughs> student engagement's really important. Just having a conversation with a student, showing that somebody cares about them, big deal. And one of the places you can do that is when you're breaking bread, you know, share a meal with a student. And Mike's been thinking about this, and what did you come up with for faculty and staff? So uh, we have a number of options for students to uh, interact with uh, faculty and staff in the residence halls. So uh, starting last fall, we uh, opened it up so you can now uh, use your credit and debit cards in the residence halls. So if you'd like to come out and eat, you can do that. We also have uh, added to the student meal plans the opportunity where they could bring a staff or faculty member for lunch at no additional charge. So uh, if they'd like to spend one of their guest meals, uh, and you certainly could suggest that to them. You know, what, how about you take me over for lunch someday? They, uh, seriously, they, they would certainly welcome that. Um, 
and then the, really the third option is that there is a staff and faculty meal plan. So if you'd like to buy in for a more extended time, uh, rather than just having one or two lunches, uh, there's opportunities to do that. You could contact me directly. There's information on our website. Uh, there'll be materials up around campus. Uh, so uh, while the residence halls are specifically designed for student residents, we're trying to open that up. And so there'll be more commuter students living with us this year uh, and eating with us. And uh, you certainly would be more than welcome to join us for uh, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. So if you don't feel like cooking, uh, come on over. You know, thank you. That's great work. Really appreciate it, Mike. Uh, my experience has been that uh, I have a great meal there. The food's great. Uh, but Eric and I last year regularly uh, ate in the uh, dining halls. And it was a blast. We learned so much. And it was fun. I mean, the, the students will tell you stuff. <laughs> Some of it you want to hear. No, it was outstanding. I, every meeting was great. I really, really enjoyed it. And even when they were upset about something, it was for a good reason. And it was stuff we needed to know and work on. So I, we had a great time and great food. And it's, it's cheap to eat there. You can't beat the deal. And the quality of food's fantastic. And you get a relationship. And that's, that's building this community. That's the, the social attachment we all have and the, and the care we can show for our students. Well, one more. John, did you want to ask one? One more and then we got to go. Sorry, I don't mean to keep people from their work, but just to, I, I'd just be curious to know your glimpse into the future. If we solve the enrollment issue and we hit it out of the park with the capital campaign and we solve the state issue, what, give us a picture of what you, where you see this university in five or 10 years. I'd like to be now. a national model university. I'd like to, uh, to, higher education in America is under assault. Uh, people think it's ready for a big shakeup. Some people point at technology as being that disruptive influence. I'm not sure that's right. But this country has enormous opportunities and big challenges. Poverty continues to be a recurrent challenge. It's the root of many issues in our country. Um, uh, what's going on in Ferguson? You know, we've been watching that uh, with horror on TV. It's so sad to watch that going on. A lot of the root of that is poverty. What's a university about? It's about transforming lives and making society better. And I'd like to be a national model where we do that. You know, a national model where we bring students in and they work with brilliant faculty and staff and they're linked out into the, the world, into the world of work, whether it be the profit or not profit sectors. And they're inspired to change the world. And that triangle offense that I put up there earlier, I think that's how you do it. You hook the faculty, staff, and students with the external world so that they're really getting that hands-on experience. They're developing those skills to be successful. And at the core, the support services that all of us play in this institution to bond that thing together so we can really do that work. I don't see other universities doing that. And uh, if you can put that together and start those connections and build those connections, then your job, John, in, in raising money is going to be a lot easier because people are going to see the vision of what we're doing and the impact we're having and they're going to want to invest in that. They're going to want to move us forward. So that, I think that triangle offense and those linkages are going to be a vision of the future. That's what we're going to talk about in our October 3rd strategic planning retreat and talk about how do we operationalize those triangles all over the institution and build those triangles into a, a, a national model. We can do that. I'm, I'm really excited about that opportunity. And uh, if questions didn't get answered today and we still have them on cards since we're, at, we're done here, uh, we'll get those back up on the web and we'll, uh, the slides we'll put on my website as well. So we'll get those answers out as well as the information that we had up here. And do look at uh, my website for other slideshows. We've got other slideshows up there that have really good information and they won't put you to sleep. Uh, one of them from the IBHE is about a 70 slide one, but it lays out where higher education is in America. It's a really good foundational piece to get a feel for it. Okay, thanks for coming. Go Huskies, let's have a great semester.